probably know by now I like to start off with sometimes a little historical event uh, to frame the, the homily. And so I, going back to the life of John Paul II, uh, before he became Pope in 1978, he was simply Karol Wojtyla, the Archbishop of Krakow in Poland. And he grew up in a t very difficult time in Poland's history, although Poland's had lots of difficult times. But remember, the Nazi Germany, uh, Nazi Germany had invaded in 1939, had conquered Poland and occupied it. And then the Soviet Union, the Russians, came back uh, on the other direction and occupied Poland until, again, 1989. So for decades, Poland was under totalitarian uh, dictatorship and rule. And part of this oppression was experienced by the Poles as a result of these atheistic powers that were trying to, uh, again, oppress or control a people who were steeped in Catholicism. In every Polish village and church, there, uh, village or town, there was a, a steeple that would rise into the air. In sharp contrast between the Catholicism of the people and then the Marxist rulers who were over the country. So the Communist Party in the 1950s, for instance, afterwards, they, uh, the, the war, they said, you know, we are the wave of the future. Communism is going to be what the, the revolution is going to take over. And this Catholicism is going to be this, this passing, historically dead thing. It's going to go away. And so the perfect opportunity uh, to sort of present and, and prove this theory was the government decided to build a new town on the outskirts of Krakow called Nova Huta. And it was going to be a model town of the new Marxist world. So this was going to be a, a town centered upon factories with the latest technology and it, for this enlightened proletariat that was rising up. And it was going to be up to date in every way. Best of all, it would be the first city in Polish history without any church. No church would be allowed in this city. This was going to be a community that would glorify the Marxist man, not this make-believe God. So as this town started to take shape, the Archbishop of Krakow, what is he going to do? These people deserve the, the faith. So what, what are you going to do? So there could be no construction of a church in communist Poland without permission from the state. So the Archbishop decided, I'm going to create a fact on the ground the government is just going to have to deal with, even though they don't want to. I'm not going to give them any choice. I'm just going to, I'm going to change the facts of life. So he appointed a priest to Nova Huda, even though there's no parish there. He created one. As he said, he sent this priest to, to offer mass in an open field in Nova Huda, where the church should be. But he said, this is going to be an open field. We're, just going, to, we're going to have an outdoor mass. So people just keep on, came, and every Sunday for years, rain or shine, People with hundreds of thousands of people would show up, they'd have their masses. And again, it's just simply to establish the fact that there really is a parish here. There's people here of God. Finally, in 1967, after I don't know how many requests by the archbishop, the government finally allowed the Catholics of Nova Huta a building permit. They issued a permit. But they said, no access to materials. And again, in that country, if the government doesn't give you access to the building materials, it's not going to happen. So the faithful people did not let that block them. So they, they begged, they borrowed, they bought bricks, sheet metal, electric wire, everything needed to build, a, frankly, a huge church. And for 10 years, so it took 10 years, the people contributed their own labor. Certainly the government was not going to let pay anybody to do this. So for 10 years, people built this on their own time. And it had a, this church a unique design. It was designed in the shape of a giant Noah's Ark. It's all, it's, now it's called the Ark Church. And this was a perfect representation of its function. This was going to be the Ark that the people of God were going to shelter in during this lasting out, to sort of, and during the storm of this imposed atheistic government, not for 40 days and 40 nights, but for more 40 years, for 40 years. Now, I tell you the story, the history of Nova Huda and the church there, 
because I think it illustrates some important things about the nature of the church. First of all, the church is not buildings, it's people. Carol Wattiwa knew that. I'm going to put people, there are people there, there are Catholics, whether you want to admit it or not, government, they're there. And so it's these people standing in the fields for years receiving the body and blood of Christ. This is the church. And yet, it's also true that we, the body of Christ, we also need buildings. There, there's a structure. There is a infrastructure that's necessary. The upkeep in the building of buildings is important. Physical realities. There's a reason why we call the church as whole, the people of God, but also buildings are called the church. Again, there's these shelters. The flock needs good shepherds, pattern after Christ. So, yes, it was the abiding, deep faith of these people that permitted Nova Huda to, to come forth and to be built for the victory to be attained. But it would not have happened without the archbishop. It would not have happened without his coordination, his interface with the government, his perseverance, his stubbornness, his faith. So the church is not simply individual believers. It's not simply individual parishes. The church is also these dioceses, these local churches, united around a bishop, a successor of the apostles. And when all those elements are together, the people of God can change the world. We have this impact. There's this presence. Even in the face of the fiercest opposition of the surrounding culture. So today, I, I tell again that story and those needs and that shape of the church as I preach about this year's annual Catholic appeal. The, the appeal that helps the archbishop in his ministry. And why it's so important that we support our archbishop and all the ministries of the wider church. For instance, we do need good shepherds. And so for men who are going to give their lives to the church, that formation and education, it's a full-time thing. You can't work and go to seminary at the same time at this point. So thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 per year altogether. So again, there has to be some central coordination of this. And it's other things as well, whether it's the homeless shelters, the soup kitchens, even those people who are coordinating down the chancery, all the actions of our church, we need, again, we need that whole structure, the resources and the coordination of the entire archdiocese. And while this is not communist-dominated Eastern Europe, our society is increasingly hostile to the faith as well. We need to stand together. Numbers matter. Can we have a united voice? Do we have a leader? Again, the idea of the, the importance of the archbishop, when we support him, we support one another in this mission that, that Christ gave us as a church. So the people of Nova Huda, they dedicated their time and talent and treasure. They may not have thought of it in those terms, but that's what they gave. Or the, the church would not have existed. One of the reasons I tell the story, it's such a clear story. Of if those things had not been there, there would have been no church. In fact, they had to, they had to really push it to the extreme. Again, we're not Nova Huda. But we are called to echo their courageous faith, and we are united to them because we're the same people with the same faith. Church, the same church serving, sustaining the same Lord, Savior, Jesus Christ. So I just, again, please continue this year. You'll get that little envelope in the mail. Annual Catholic Appeal. I've already sent mine in. I've, I've, uh, I've done my part. But please continue St. Monica's tradition of giving the support of the Archbishop. And in doing that, again, we continue to proclaim the fact that in the face of the world that would tell us otherwise, we are and we will always remain the children of God following the mission of his Son.